Okay, my friends, welcome back to Staying Strong for Marriage. This is a YouTube channel dedicated to helping people go through marriage separation or divorce. God, hope you're doing okay. I know it is freaking awful. It's so awful. But God really tends to bring people through awful situations, and it forces us to lock down. We have to decide where's our worth and value coming from, who are we, how to forgive, how to move forward, how to overcome trials, and then it like it says in uh, Romans 5, you know, those um, trials, they lead to perseverance, um, to joy, and, you know, we're able to overcome things in the future. I think we're going to be more able to bless people in the future, but for right now, just focus on recovering, you know. Um, one thing I want to look at today, because the channel so much looks at what are some of the reasons that our um, divorces are so high and the family is so unstable. Well, I'm a Protestant, so help me out. Forgive me if I misspeak or misrepresent. I'm not here to offend anybody. Point fingers across, you know, the aisle or whatever you want to say. Um, but I mean, I I definitely believe the Catholic Church is legit. I don't feel like or where it's like, you know, it's only us and everyone else is wrong. I don't think it's like that. You know, I just don't. But there's some very different rules. It's very I've tried to cover these things just from the biblical perspective. You know, when are we allowed to divorce and remarry? And I looked at a lot of different authors that looked at that from a lot of different angles. Well, now there's this, as if things weren't complicated enough, another bit about annulments. Um, I did one of those videos. It was called Which Churches Protect Marriages? Uh, which denominations have the highest and lowest divorce rates? And pretty much in every survey I looked at, Catholics had really low rates of divorce. Now, one of the questions that I really was curious about is, well, is that because people have kind of this out, this annulment out where it's like, well, I could have been married twice, but my first one was like not legit. So it's not official. It didn't really count. It's not an official divorce. It's just it wasn't a legitimate first marriage that could you could see that could push the numbers down. Well, what I do like so you can see here United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. I just went to a couple sites, but I like how they start this out. Why does the church require a divorced Catholic to obtain a declaration of nullity before marrying in the church? And the answer, it says, in fidelity to Jesus' teaching, the church believes that marriage is a lifelong bond. See Matthew 19, 1 through 10. So I like how they started out. That's nice. Therefore, unless one spouse has died, the church requires the divorced Catholic to obtain a declaration of nullity before marrying someone else. The tribunal process seeks to determine if something essential was missing at the moment of consent, that is, the time of the wedding. If so, the church can declare that a valid marriage was never actually brought about on the wedding day. I'm not really sure what I think about that. It seems very convenient. Is that offensive? I don't know. Let's see. Let's see. So I like this. There's a lot of different things I'm going to look at here. Like basically to give it to you quickly, there's the lack of capacity. There's the lack of consent. And you can see here, there's the lack of form. What the heck is lack of form? Well, I like the way that this one does it better than some of these other ones. So let's start here. Marriage grounds or grounds for marriage annulment in the Catholic church. So you can see insufficient use of reason. Uh, you or your spouse did not know what was happening during the marriage ceremony because of insanity, mental illness, or lack of consciousness. Okay, doesn't apply to most of us. Grave lack of discretionary judgment concerning essential matrimonial rights and duties. You or your spouse was affected by some serious circumstance or factor that made you unable to judge or evaluate either the decision to marry or the ability to create a true marital relationship. It's getting pretty subjective, but psychic natured incapacity to assume marital obligations. You or your spouse at the time of consent was unable to fulfill the obligations of marriage because of a serious psychological disorder or other condition. What does that mean? I mean, how many people are on um, antidepressants? Is that like, a, I don't know, does that qualify? Uh, ignorance about the nature of marriage. So you or your spouse did not know that marriage is a permanent relationship between a man and a woman ordered toward the procreation of offspring by means of some sexual cooperation. So I guess if you didn't know that the Catholic Church thought that one of the essential aspects of marriage was to produce children, then I guess you're exempt. Uh, it's... You're in a situation of nullity. Error of person. Reason for marriage annulment. You or your spouse intended to marry a specific individual who was not the individual with whom marriage was celebrated. For example, male or brides. Otherwise, this is rarely, uh, otherwise this rarely occurs in the United States. Error about uh, quality of a person. You or your spouse intended to marry someone who either possessed or did not possess a certain quality, i.e., 
social status, marital status, education, religious conviction, freedom from disease, or arrest record. The quality must have been directly and principally intended. So, I mean, wouldn't it be fair to say that, uh, let's say that I have a, a sexual disease or maybe any disease. Maybe I have a, I don't know, a, a heart disease or a, I don't know, any kind of disease, right? Uh, so now that I have to go around my whole life knowing that at any moment my marriage can be stripped from me and that, you know, or social status. What if I lose my job? Marital status. Okay, I don't know, education. I didn't get enough education. I don't have the right degree. My industry dried up. Um, religious conviction. What's that? Um, well, we'll just keep reading. Uh, you or your spouse was intentionally deceived about the presence or absence of a quality in the other. The reason for this deception was to obtain consent for marriage. Hmm. So how much money a person makes, how many previous sexual partners they've had, uh, the school that they went to, the, I don't know, the, you thought that they uh, wanted to live here or had, you know, certain career goals or savings goals or social goals or how many children they wanted or, you know, what could be the other things, part of town they want to live in, city they want to live in, close to your parents, close to their parents. Um, Wanted to, I've heard of couples that wanted to work overseas and then one person got over there and they were like, whoa, this is hard. I don't want to do this anymore. And then that was it. They were kind of out and the other person was like, oh, this was like my dream. You know, I wanted to like do this international stuff. What about that? Is that a, does that apply? Total willful exclusion of marriage. You or your spouse did not intend to contract marriage as the law of the Catholic Church understands marriage. Rather, the ceremony was observed solely as a means of obtaining something other than the marriage itself. So, to obtain legal status in the country or to legitimize a child. So, what about money? What about inheritance? You know, you want to, um, I mean, I don't want to, gold digger? I don't know, isn't that the term? <laughs> That's the term, right? You know, you marry for money, you marry for status, you marry for... Uh, you know, I've heard of stories of uh, divorce care. I got to cover divorce care because that's a great class in the future. But, you know, I remember hearing a story of someone that they got married once and it was like, they're pretty much like, I married them because they were hot. You know, sexually, I was wanting to be with that person. And, you know, I didn't want to do it for the wrong reasons. So, uh, you know, in order to get God's approval. And then it didn't work out. Well, go figure. But, um, willful exclusion of children. You or your spouse married intending either explicitly or implicitly to deny the other's rights to sexual acts open to procreation so unlike the protestant churches the catholic church i mean it really holds the standard of um of having children which if you're marrying a catholic or you you're, you are a catholic or you're you know you're marrying a non-catholic or whatever you know it's important that you guys because it may be that you have really really different ideas about what's normal what's expected willful exclusion of married uh, marital fidelity you or your spouse married intending either explicitly or implicitly not to remain faithful hmm. yeah i don't know how you would really prove that i mean the act would pretty prove pretty much prove everything i don't know <clears throat> I mean, could, if you wanted out of the marriage in this situation, couldn't you just, I mean, if you want to find a loophole, just say, well, I wasn't planning on being faithful to this person, so I'm out. doesn't mean that you, like, cheated on them. You're just saying, um, okay, there, here's an out. Like, let me use let me use this one. And I'm sorry, you guys, if I'm being too negative. I just, look, the desire of the channel is to help people stay married, to avoid what Jesus called adultery. And depending upon how you look at the once saved, always saved stuff, like I said, you know, Paul said that he wanted to preach to others and live in such a way that he would not be disqualified. What would it mean to be disqualified? This is a man planting churches. He's, you know, giving everything for the, for the gospel, for his relationship with Christ. What would he mean to be disqualified? To be disqualified, I can only imagine what it means to lose his inheritance in the kingdom of God that he was expecting himself to run out his race throughout the course of his life and not deviate. Well, in other places in 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 9, you know, it says that uh, do not be deceived. Uh, I mean, adulterers will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So where do you land on those things? And, you know, for a lot of these things, it's like, you guys, 
maybe you can get out of these divorces or out of these marriages and not get into adultery but i'm not so sure i mean one thing i would say as a protestant is like wow this is why you know it's difficult i think for protestants to to push for a, a simple idea of just following jesus's message of you know marriages for life Romans 7 says that, you know, anyone that marries someone else while their first spouse is alive commits adultery. That's what it says. But then when you get into church culture and you start talking with people, you find out that people have all these extra reasons, all these, you know, 10, 20, 30 different reasons why, yeah, well, I'm in an exceptional case, and here's why, like, my second marriage is an adultery. And I've tried to really look at that because I want to protect people. You know, I want to see more marriages make it. And I think we need to have a better sense and a, a, a more serious sense of, how sacred marriage is, you know, that it is a picture of, of Christ to the world and um, the relationship of God with his people is the picture of a, a man and a woman married. I think that's very, very clear. And so, well, when, I mean, Christian marriages are failing more often than atheist marriages, I wouldn't expect the, the world to be all that impressed with us. That seems logical, right? So, and look, but then you get into this list, look, and we're only... I mean, you can see the scroll bar, we're only halfway through this document, and we've already run through 10, 12 different reasons why, you know, well, I can go ahead and get remarried according to the tribunal. I mean, how hard would it be to approve some of these things? I mean, if I have 30 different options in where I could say, like, well, you know, my spouse who isn't here and who isn't going to come to the tribunal and isn't going to weigh in on the situation, you know, they, they intended to, let's use that one that we just looked at, they intended to not be faithful to me. I'm not saying they cheated. I'm just saying that their intention when we got married was to not be faithful to me. And so now I can have an out. Willful exclusion of children, marital fidelity, uh, marriage permanence. Willful exclusion of marriage permanence. You or your spouse married intending either explicitly or implicitly not to create a permanent relationship, retaining an option to divorce. So... Uh, I mean, what do they call those things? The prenuptials, right? A future condition. You or your spouse attached a future condition to your marriage decision. For example, you will complete your education. Your income will be at a certain level, and you will remain in this area. I just talked about that. But yeah, past condition. You or your spouse attached a past condition, so your decision to marry, and that condition did not exist. For example, I will marry you provided that you have never been married before. I will marry you provided you have graduated from college. I will marry you, you know, considering... Uh, you're a virgin, or you didn't use drugs, or, you know, you don't have an STD, or you didn't have an abortion, or, you know, you don't lose your, I don't know, whatever, uh, dentist degree, or, or fill in the blank, right? Pres uh, present condition, you or your spouse attached a present condition to your decision to marry, and that condition did not exist. For example, I will marry you provided you don't have any debt. You or your spouse married because of an external, physical, or moral force that you could not resist. I wonder if that means, like, if you got the shotgun wedding, if you, you know, you got, because there's those people, they, they get pregnant, right? And then it's like, well, you know, God would want us to get married for the sake of the child. I really have a good friend. He did that. It looked like that was not the good decision that his wife or the woman that he married uh, was not ready to be a wife. She was not ready to be in a marriage commitment. It just, she wasn't ready. Um, so I don't know if that's what they're talking about. Fear. You or your spouse chose to marry because of fear that was grave and inescapable and was caused by an outside source. Hmm. Interesting. Error regarding marital unity that determined the will. You or your spouse married believing that marriage was not necessarily an exclusive relationship. So open relationships or, you know, whatever. Um... Error regarding marital indissolubility that determined the will. You or your spouse married believing that civil law had the power to dissolve marriage and that remarriage was acceptable after civil divorce. So basically, you got married, you filed the paperwork at the courts, then you thought God was cool with it, you got remarried, and then all of a sudden you're in a situation where now you realize, nope, that's not how God sees things. Error regarding marital sacramental dignity that determined the will. You or, and your spouse married believing that marriage is not a sacred or religious relationship but merely a civil contract or arrangement. I'm just wondering, it just seems so easy to, to accuse or at least 
give one of these reasons as a reason if you wanted to to work these rules in your favor lack of new consent during convalidation after your marriage you and your spouse participated in a catholic ceremony and you or your spouse believe that one you were already married two the catholic ceremony was merely a blessing and three the consent given during the catholic ceremony had no real effect hmm. that's interesting um we'll go through this really really quickly lack of capacity so remember lack of capacity lack of consent lack of form it gives us some idea of like how all Christians don't see things the same, and yet we're all kind of one group, and the ideas of like this side over here affects maybe the whole. And so what is this lack of capacity? In order for a person to marry validly, he must be capable of marriage. If he is lacking anything that requires him to be capable of marriage, then a wedding will not result in a valid marriage. Thus, there will be grounds for annulment. Such capacity is required on the part of both parties attempting marriage. In either case, of one or of both parties lacking the capacity to marriage, a valid marriage cannot come into existence between the two. So, for example, a party who is already married and is not capable of marrying a second spouse. Similarly, active bishops or people who have taken uh, vows of chastity. Other such impediments that are not obvious, insufficient age. So, yep, also... Uh, since marriage is partly about procreation, pre-existence, and, pre and permanent impotence renders party incapable of marriage hmm so I wonder if that means that like if your spouse wants to use contraception for a time is a contraception always sinful for Catholics um, parties too closely related to, related and are incapable of marrying each other so yep so incest any of these factors may constitute grounds for a nullity due to the lack of capacity. Additionally, a party who is simply incapable of consenting to a marriage is incapable of validly entering into one, for example, uh, serious psychological disorders. Okay, so lack of consent. For example, the church's understanding of marriage includes that the fact that marriage is a lifelong union ordered toward procreation. They keep hinting on this or, or hitting on this. If a party does not have at least a similar basic understanding of marriage, he does not enter into marriage validly. But even when a party does possess a sufficient understanding of marriage, if he intentionally excludes an essential property or essential element of marriage, he does not sufficiently consent to it. So I wonder, do that mean, um, so like sexless marriages, based on 1 Corinthians 7, you know, you have this idea where men and women, if they decide to get into marriage, the way it works is each is not their own anymore, that they have certain sexual obligations to the other. So that's an, I would say, an essential element. I wonder, are Catholics allowed to annul a marriage for, um, you know, unwillingness by their partner? The essential properties of marriage are unity and indissolubility. Unity means that the marriage is an exclusive relationship between one husband and one wife. Indissolubility means that it is a lifelong commitment between the two. Entering into marriage without the intention of fidelity excludes unity and therefore invalidates the marriage. Similarly, a party who weds with the understanding that he can always get a divorce understood to dissolve the marriage. If things don't work out, does not sufficiently consent to marriage. So if you believe in, I guess, okay. Exclusion of either essential property of marriage is grounds for annulment. The essential element of elements of marriage include, among other things, it being toward, ordered toward the procreation and education of children, a party who weds with the intent to always exclude from the relationship it's ordering towards procreation and validly marries. So really, I mean, if you're, what, I mean, how do you draw the line on that? If you have two kids and you want a third and, and your spouse doesn't want a third, then, you know, you can get out? I don't know. It's... <laughs> I don't know. This doesn't mean that the spouse cannot ever choose to regulate procreation. Ah, okay, there you go. Through moral means, see the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 2368, in order to space the births from their children. But it does mean that certain willful exclusion of procreation altogether does. So I guess you got to have some kids. You can space them out. There can be some family planning. But you can't just say, uh, I want to be, what are those things called? The um, dual earner, no, no children. In the case of sterility, not impotence, marriage may still be ordered toward procreation if the spouse does not willfully exclude the right to potentially procreative, procreative acts, even though it's known in advance that the couple is infertile. So just keep having sex, maybe, you know, who knows. 
Additionally, the education of any offspring resulting from the marriage must not be excluded. Such education includes the religious education of the children. Therefore, the intention to positively exclude the religious education of offspring invalidates a marriage. So if you're not going to take your kids to church, you're not going to teach them the catechism, you're not going to share the gospel with them, then the marriage is null. Since each party must freely consent to a marriage, anyone forced into a marriage does not enter into it with sufficient consent. Thus, a true shotgun wedding does not result in a valid marriage. Ah. Fear that impedes the party's judgment may also be sufficient to invalidate a marriage. For example, it might happen in the case of an out-of-wedlock pregnancy, especially involving a very young couple. So far, okay, so then lack of form. When a Catholic person gets married, it must be valid. This usually entails a marriage contracted before a priest or deacon in the presence of two witnesses. Once a Catholic, uh, once a person is a Catholic, he remains bound by the church's form of marriage, even if he later falls away from the church. Huh. The code of the canon states the form must be observed if at least one of the parties contracting the marriage was baptized into the Catholic Church or received into it. It says the church's uh, God-given authority imposes this law. Jesus gave the church the authority to enact such laws that bind her citizens. Matthew 16, 18, 18, 18. Thus, a Catholic ordinarily must observe uh, canonical form in order for his marriage to be valid. If a Catholic wishes to validly marry any other way, for example, observing his fiancée's Protestant form, he must obtain dispensation from the Catholic canonical form from his bishop. This ordinarily is handled through the local pastor, blah, 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 blah. Note, okay, additionally, if a Catholic wishes to marry a non-Catholic, he must first obtain a dispensation from the bishop in order to for this marriage to be valid. To receive such a dispensation, the Catholic party must declare that he is prepared to remove dangers of defecting from the Catholic faith, and he must sincerely promise to do all that is in his power to raise offspring resulting from the marriage in the Catholic Church. The non-Christian spouse must be informed of the Catholic party's obligation and promise in this regard. Both parties must be instructed about the essentials of marriage that cannot be excluded. Failure of the Catholic party to obtain dispensation from his bishop before entering into such a marriage impedes a valid marriage from coming into existence as such a constitutes grounds for annulment. Unfaithfulness at any point in the marriage might be considered by the marriage tribunal to be evidence of a spouse's exclusion from the element of unity at the time the marriage was conceived. Such matters are for the sole determination of the tribunal. A party seeking annulment is not obligated to determine precisely which grounds impeded a valid marriage from coming into existence. He can and should cooperate with the marriage tribunal's questions and remember that the ultimate determination of the grounds for the annulment rests with the church. While there may be multiple grounds that could be considered a determination of a single invalidating factor is all that is necessary for a declaration of nullity. Grounds may be acceptable to only one party, but that is all it takes to declare a marriage null. Indeed, a marriage tribunal may find a single factor that can be quickly and easily ruled on and therefore not consider any other factors. For example, in the case of a lack of form, an abbreviated document documentary process is often applied. Finally, in some cases, no grounds for annulment will be found even after appeals have been exhausted in such case in such cases, it is critical to keep in mind that the authority to make a determination of nullity, nullity rests solely with the church. The church has stressed that the internal form is not sufficient for the determination of nullity. Civil divorce might be necessary for the protection and care of the spouses and their children, but unless the church declares that marriage null, it, it validly must be upheld. Faithful followers of Christ must heed Jesus' words what therefore ever God is joined together, let no man put asunder. Matthew 19.6. I guess just an ending, like I'm, I'm just trying to say what's going on. Part of the reason I like doing this channel is that I learned a lot. You know, I mean, not being from a Catholic background, I really had no idea that all this stuff was going on. But it does really beg the question of what kind of footing is marriage on? You know, how is it going? What is it looking like? How will it, it be trending? Is it something you should get into? Or is it something that's really not well protected? How confident should you be if you get married that you know, you're know you gonna be able to basically follow God's will given all the various scenarios, the situations, and um, well, that's all. 
Thanks for stopping by. Um, always like, share, subscribe. Share with friends, especially that are going through divorce, or thinking about annulments, or thinking about separations, or thinking about getting remarried. It's a big deal. I think it's a huge deal to God. I think it does have eternal consequences. I think any time that we you know, deviate from the path, it's going to get us in the wrong way. Whether that means it'll have eternal consequences or not, it's something we want to avoid. We want to live righteously and in a smart way given the times one of the things that said in richard foster's celebration of discipline is you got to do the study you got to understand the culture you got to understand the times that you live in the issues of our day and in order to be salt and light you know hopefully we can do things that really spur one another on towards you know good works to righteousness to being able to be salt and light in a world that i mean needs answers it's desperate you know the i mean man the drug rates the divorce rates, right? All the people that are upset over politics, looking for, you know, the politicians to be our saviors, our heroes, our solutions, our salvation, you know, and we, we have Christ, we know Christ and not everyone believes it, but it's our jobs to be ambassadors, to be able to stand up, to be able to give a thoughtful, smart way with our lives and our words as far as, hey, this is a credible option, you know? Yeah, faith may be hard to understand, you know, but there's a lot of things about life we can't understand. I think that's true. So anyway, good luck to you guys out there. I hope you can just do the best you can with your kids, your marriages, in your society. As you go, uh, go with God. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks. Bye.